So thank you very much once again. Uh, you are come, welcome back to Information Some Theories. Um, part of what we'll be doing today is to look into what a theory is and then try to understand how we use theories in a PhD economic process. So start by understanding the concepts of um, theories and the role they play. Last, I'll do a recap a little bit on um, what we did last time in the research class so that we'll take it forward from there. So um, ideally, we should cover these sessions, but we cannot cover all of them in one session because it's a PhD class. You have to take your time and, um, and, and, and let the students comprehend what you are trying to deliver. So my communication will be in a piecemeal approach so that we can be able to make sure that everybody is following. Okay, so please participate in the sessions, including um, the teacher assistants who are here. I hope Alfred is also here. Okay, so um, this book is what we I use for teaching, but I think I want you to know that by end of August, you have a new version of the book, which is much more voluminous than this one and has new content. So from March, uh, from August, you will see uh, more content in specific areas like theory, analysis, uh, being put in this, and then maybe literature review being put into the book. Okay, so what is a risk? Uh, what is a research theory, and what is how does it work in the, the research world? Now, whenever you are carrying out research, one thing that you need to understand the research process is that the center of the research process is what we call the research theory. That guides the selection of um, data, guides the um, selection of even co um, constructs they are going to study, and how the constructs relate together. And that doesn't mean everybody will have a theory in his research work, not necessarily, but it's one of the core instruments that helps you to carry out good, good research. Now, that is said, but the theory itself has its own meaning. And then there's also another synonymous word that has been going around called the research framework. In fact, the research framework is, is much more important than the theory, because that is what is framed in research. If the theory can, becomes a subset of the research framework. So anything that we call a research framework is whatever frames the research. So it's not always that the theory is the one that is used as a research framework. Sometimes somebody may not use a theory, may use a category of factors derived from the literature. By reading the literature and developing a research framework is possible. Somebody may even pick his research questions and use it to frame his research. So in that particular sense, the research is being framed by the research questions. But ideally, um, in terms of a PhD work, you always want to have a center, a central ethos being the theory. That because you are contributing to knowledge, and the knowledge itself has been established by a basis of certain theories. And those theories try to tell us how certain things work in society. And you may go there to either challenge it, to either test it, to either extend it, to even try to look at whether it can be applied in different and in different disciplines, in different scenarios, in different domains. So you, the researcher, you try as a PhD researcher, you dwell on theories a lot. So don't think that because I mentioned research framework does not always hinge on a theory. It means that you also have a research framework that has no theory in it. Theorization is the central ethos of a, 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 a PhD. So think, take that into consideration. Now we know that research is a, uh, is, is used as, um, in terms of its basic definition, it's an investigation to a particular topic. And we argued out in our last session when we we're having um, qualitative research that it's not every every investigation that leads to research because every research has to be a systematic and organized way of finding answers to questions. The theory lies in this organized part. The organized is just the process. In the central part of the process is the theory. Good. The systematic tells you the philosophy behind the research and how the people of science of the, the scientific community of that research and what they expect as uh, relevant knowledge or acceptable knowledge in that scientific discipline. So whenever you carry out the research in the organization part, you are going to respond to the philosophy that belongs to the systematic part. So last semester like this, you were taught philosophy of management, you were taught philosophy of information systems. Those things are what is going to be central here in the I'm sorry, you're not seeing my annotation. Those things are what is going to be central here at the systematic part. Oh, forgive me. Then, so the systematic part is going to be built upon the, the, the theories, the philosophies that you have learned. The organization is just the method or the structure of the, uh, of the, of doing the research. Having a, so you have a topic, you, you collect data around the topic, you collect um, literature around the topic to define the right question. After defining the right question from the research problem, you go to 
through your objectives to come up with a research design, then you collect data, you interpret the data, you analyze the data, interpret the data, and you communicate the research. So that organization is what we call the research process. And the central part of it is the is a ball. That the ball is called the the ball is called the the, the research theory. That kind of helps to be able to put the constructs that you are using to study the phenomenon into in, into perspective. Okay, so now where does it all fall? Whenever you are doing the research, you have an objective to be able to find answers to questions. But to be able to find those answers to questions, you need to ask the right question. So we say that the centrality of every research is the question that is being asked. But when you have a right question, you still need to be able to design the right study. That design is more about the selection of constructs you are going to use to study the, the, the question or study find the answers to the question. And then the way you're going to collect the data and you're going to interpret the data, we call that one the research design. Central of central step in the research design is what we call the research framework. That research framework is just a, presents the way of studying the variable. It's concerned the phenomenon in order to be able to find answer to the research problem that you have. Now, every research framework will present a frame in which the research has to take place. The frame are the type of variables that you are you take into consideration that they matter for this particular phenomenon. It means that when I've got a research problem and I take to give it to two people, it's possible they'll have different frames. They'll have different frames because of the way we are, understand things are different. And also one thing that could happen is that we may read different literature and we may have such different focus. For example, somebody who may be coming from maybe, let's say, um, a music background and is coming to do research on adoption of technology, he may end up being influenced by certain things that may be different for somebody who comes from a healthcare background who is also coming to study adoption of technology. So what I'm trying to point out here is that the selection of variables will come from the reading and the knowledge that you have. It can come from the of, of, of experiential knowledge you have by your experience and the knowledge that you may also gain by your theoretical understanding of what exists. So as you read the literature, it forms your, it, it reshapes your thinking and it helps you to know what is the possibilities. And from the possibilities, you may choose certain variables to do the study. So please, I just want you to note that the frame of the research is what uh, is, is just the variables you have selected and then you have put them in a manner to relate to, or to try to explain or predict or explore or describe the phenomenon of study. What you should also notice is that that selection process can be done in many different ways. That selection process of the variables can be done in many different ways. So a research framework is just not the selection process. The research framework is the actual what or selection, whatever you have selected as your variables that you are going to study the phenomenon. That means that the variables that are selected should be related to the phenomenon. I hope you understand me. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay, so I'll bring you some water. So we call it a research framework because it frames the research. What does it do? Framing the research means that it outlines the, the variables or the relation and, the, and, the, and their relationships in order to be able to explain, predict, or describe a social, pheno a social phenomena. Now, let's look at some examples. So I'm going to pick a number of examples to be able to explain this to you so that you can appreciate what I'm trying to talk about. So let's So the first one I would like to look at is um, okay, this is a study that I did with a number of people on determinants of e-learning adoption in versus in the evidence from a developing country. Please, can you see? Please, yes, can you see? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Good. Now, from here, it says that the study sought to explain, explore the technological, organizational, environmental determinants. This is my selection frame. So I've told you what I'm going to do. So I'm looking at technological, organizational, environmental determinants of e-learning adoption. This is means that my questions are built around A, B, and C. It means that it's likely that this is going to be my frame for the research. Another construct, the nature of course, was also added to the traditional construct of the technology, organization, environment framework. So there's a framework 
Now later I'll explain what a framework is and what the theory is, and what the model is, and all those things. And I think today is not the day for that. Let's get the basics first. Then tomorrow or next time we can then look into those things. So about technology, organization, and environment. This is a, a framework that helps you to be able to explore um, the factors that influence adoption of a technology. But for more from a, a, what you call a, an environmental organization and technology approach. So you are trying to call this an interactionist framework. Interactionist frameworks are the ones that take central, central types of set, set, um, a, 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 a comprehensive set of variables together to be able to examine a phenomenon. What am I trying to say? When you are studying adoption, eh, you can have technology variables alone. So when you take a technology-based framework, you can have something like technology acceptance model, that's TAM. Then you can also take organizational or behavioral theories alone. You can have something like theory of plan behavior. It will always focus on behavior issues. There's no technology in it. Then you can also have an environmental framework that can look at culture, like um, Hofstede's culture dimensions, which is also, it's not made for technology, but it's made to understand how culture influences people in your society. Now, people, uh, later on, a gentleman put this thing together, a set of all researchers put this, put this, put this together, called Atan Tonad, Tonaski, or so you'll find the name is T and something. They published it in a book um, which was edited by somebody else. But the, 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 the theory, the framework was a, a set of technology factors put together with a set of organization factors and environmental factors. So that when people are doing, they realize that technology adoption is not just a technology dimension issue, it's not just a behavioral issue, it's not just an environmental issue. It's a, inter, a complex interaction of these variables. So for anybody to do a good study, he has to put these variables together to carry out the study. So in this particular study, you realize that we are using the technology organizational framework, but I study e -learning. But technology is just about the e-learning technology. Organization is just about the firm or the institution where the e-learning is being implemented. Environment is just the context in which the thing is being applied. So where this one may be, the organization can even be at the classroom level, the context can be the university. Where this one can also be at the university level, the organization can be the university, there can be the country. So the level of ICT penetration, the educational policies in the country can all be part of it, depending on where you conceptualize it. But you see, we are studying e-learning. E-learning is not just about technology organization and environment. There has to be some content the lecturer has to come and teach. But that content is not captured here. So the person went forward to say that we have to look at the nature of the course, the type of course we are teaching, because it's not all courses that are malleable to an online platform. For example, you are doing a physics class, and most of the things are experiments, and you are supposed to be doing the experiments in person. You cannot e-virtualize their part. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So he, the, the, author real, the authors realize that there's a need for us to look at even these environmental frameworks are technology determinant and organization determinant, environmental determinant for looking at um, technological solutions. There is also a nature, the nature of the, the, the thing that we are, we are applying to. We are applying this one to e-learning. E Learning has, is about um, um, teaching and teaching courses. And we have to understand that courses have their content. So the content you're going to teach has to be malleable to the technological variables, the organizational variables and environmental variables. So have you taken that into consideration? That is why he realized that this is, cannot solve it alone. So what am I trying to say? It's possible that the frame that you have selected may not be exhaustive. So you have to add other variables or add another frame. So then sometimes some people may use two theories in one research or three theories, but this one, the person is using one theory and one other variable from the literature to add to it. So let's look at it. Look at the literature review. We focus on reviewing three main areas of, that are particularly relevant to provide a theoretical foundation for research. The determinants of e-learning adoption. Sorry, bro. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry, Prof. It's, it didn't show earlier on. I showing you now. Yes, it went very fast, so it wasn't showing the literature review part. I show you now. The determinants of e-learning adoption investors with a focus on studies on the developing countries. The e-learning stakeholder perspective of researchers and then conceptual approaches in e-learning research. So after looking at all of these things, and the person was able to understand which of them will play a key role in the work he is trying to do. So it, he looked at it in terms of the fact that the studies are as outlined in table one, have varying propositions on the factors that support and inhibit the adoption of e-learning in the higher education, higher learning institutions or universities. The propositions are grouped into three main determinants of adoption, technology, 
organization environment. So these are the determinants of adoption traditionally. And an additional factor referred to nature of the course is being offered on the, to be offered on the e-learning platform. So they are adding that additional factor. Each category receives a fair share of received attention. So let's start with the clinical factors. Let me just try to show you how the thing works. Let me give me a second. Oh, sorry. Oh, my, having the problem like this. I've gone too far. Sorry. What are we doing for? So let me keep on turning till I get it. Right. I've gotten it right. <laughs> I think some pages are 10, some pages is in 10. <laughs> so, oh, it's continued. So let's start from here. Good. So this is the first article. What theory did he use? He used a technology acceptance model. He sampled 47 students from Morocco University. The determinants he was using are, look at computer self-efficacy and perceived usefulness. These are the variables he used. Then you say technology acceptance, acceptance and information system success model. That's another type of theory. So. We, we call the IS success model by Dillon and McLean. And then this is a technology acceptance model, which is a very old technology, um, theory that exists already. So he chose perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use, and system quality. Then here, the basic technology acceptance model. So you see, the technology acceptance model is used a lot because it's e learning. And look at the papers there longitudinal savior 249, very qualitative. Perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use, which are the tenets of the technology acceptance model, purpose of the usage. So it's like the what are you using it for? It's like so what we are talking about, the content. Perceived learning assistance, things coming from the environment or the organization. And then perceived community building assistance. So this may be environment, this may be the organization, the classroom learning assistance. So he has got a number of variables there. Then a conceptual framework. So this one, he just wrote conceptual framework. Means that he didn't pick on a theory. He built one based on variables he has read from the literature. An online questionnaire distributed to all public and private universities, integrated social learning elements, such as various social media tools. Okay. The Lone and McLean model, that's the IS information system success model. This is what somebody's using here. Merging e-learning success model. So you use the one, the Lone and McLean to do what you call the e-learning success model by replacing the IS here with the e-learning. And then he, he and this is where he came up technical system quality, educational system quality, content and information quality. So you have satisfaction, benefits of usage and goal achievement. Interesting. Then use the, this is why use the tool framework, the one we just mentioned. And you lose information systems expertise, expected benefits, IT infrastructure, competitor, competitive pressure and educational partners. So these are shared across the three, the three dimensions. Then you come and tool. Availability of ICT infrastructure, e-learning curriculum, that's the content of e-learning, and um, e-performance -per -e expectancy, perceived use, and perceived of use, competence, competitive pressure, conceptual framework. Okay, this one too then uses content of the e-learning course and e-learning curriculum. So we are seeing a number of interesting variables being used in here. Oh. I think I turned the thing so much that it has affected. Let me, if I also save it to close, it will save it. I hope it will save it. Anyway, it has saved it. Unless I copy it again. Okay. So let's take it one by one. Let's see. Anyway, let me. I have another version of it. So let me just pick it up. Um. um Okay, let's give me a second. Okay, good. I hope you can see. Okay, so yes, yes. The research model and hypothesis. So 
the research framework is the tool framework by Ponaski and Flesher, 1990. Again, the Ponaski and Flesher tool framework seems to be a wider generic explanatory construct. So it's wide and people have used the model in different ways. It doesn't, it's not for e-learning, it's for generally the adoption of technology. So it looks at it in diverse issues. So first of all, it's a technological context. This refers to both the internal and external technologies relevant to university. That is current practice equipment internal to the institution as well as a set of available technology external to, to the firm. The, so it has IT infrastructure has influence on the e -learning, adoption of e-learning. Then he picks um, from the Davis that's term, he picks another variable from the that's perceived ease of use, influences e-learning as put So you are taking two variables. It doesn't mean that he can, there are more variables in technology constructs, but he are just taking only two. Organizational context, it refers to the study, the study refers to universities in the developing country. The review of e-learning literature, the previous chapter revealed, which is the previous chapter, the previous section. Because this was kind of scary for somebody's thesis, they didn't miss it. <laughs> previous section revealed a lot of issues and the organizational context. The first issue is to consider compatibility factor. Okay, so that's one. The greater compatibility between applications or e-learning with the practical application of the institution that adopted it in terms of beliefs, values, and past experience, needs, and priorities, and policies, the better influence on the success of the implementation of e-learning. This compatibility will lead to easier interface between the e-learning application and ordinary, practically ordinary part applications. Okay, perceived compatibility. So organization compatibility, compatibility influences adoption of e-learning. Then perceived benefits, what organization expects and what they will gain. The last one is environmental context. So environmental context, look at competitive pressure, the competition that the firm, the institution faces in their field of study. So you are competing with KNST and you are going for e-learning. What are you doing? So competitive pressure is there. The another one is the educational pattern. Sometimes e-learning is sponsored by third parties. For example, in UG like this, we receive money from the Danida, and that is what helped me to set up the e-learning, um, part of the e-learning infrastructure, and part of e-learning trainings for the whole university. So that's one. And we also got money from the Chinese government to set up a smart classroom. So I can tell you that partners is good. Lastly, added the nature of the course, which is not part of the, the initial model. And he, the nature of the course has content of the e-learning courses itself and then he has also the curriculum so two variables and then the nature of the course so if you look at it or he end up having i don't know whether he drew it or sometimes the framework is just a schematic diagram of the what you say you want to do I don't think there's a drawing in any way okay so i think it's the ending of the work rather that has the variables that he he found to be relevant. So this is it. So it's ease of use, IT infrastructure, organizational context, organizational compatibility, expected benefits, nature of the context, nature of course, content of the course, and then ELEN. Educational patterns and competitive pressure. So these ones, I think those which are less than 0 0.05 are, are, are significant. So almost all of them are significant. So this is where I'm, but some of them have got an inverse relationship with um with the organization with the variable they are looking at in terms of its impact on elem okay so this is how the person has used it you see it's it's become the center of the work it's collected data around the discussions being made around the the variables just put there even the recommendations so this is one approach any questions on this one i'll pick another one again any questions on this one any question? No, Prof. I I don't know whether it's a question or not, but uh, from what you've just described, if we pick Sakai, right, yes, as an e-learning platform, mm -hmm. uh, would you say it was it was um, adopted because I don't know which variables they were using, but were there variables such as they looked at what competitors were using? That's where they went with that, or did it go through the same uh, um, uh, system? No, I think you're confused yourself. The selection, what we are studying right now is about how students, students' perspective on the on the Sakai platform that's been deployed already. The deployment, the deployment okay. process is called implementation. I didn't study implementation of the platform. Okay. You understand okay. me? So look yes, at yes. look at the theory. 
determinants of you have a good point determinants of e-learning adoption in universities evidence for developing country so from a multi-stakeholder so we looked at for the technological organizational environment let me just show you i think the multi stakeholder is what makes it interesting and maybe i didn't show you different stakeholders were contacted some studies just look at the, what the students see i just just look at what the institutions or the lecturers see but this is one look, combined students mm -hmm. lecturers and then even administrators so some of the variables are not for lecturers or new for students so look at this so for the students the technology context issues infrastructure was the thing that they looked at for them and then organizational community and certain benefits the students had their own spirit benefits then they look at also um, environmental context the technology partners and competitive players students is what almost all the three will affect all the four will affect them but when it comes to lecturers the, mm -hmm. it's only technology context and the environmental context the organizational context particularly may not affect them even the organization creates the environment for them. The priority was on the, from the, these are the significant ones, the ones, so it was not significant, the organization context was not significant to the lecturers, but it was the educational partners, which is from the environmental was significant and then the nature of the course. When it comes to administrators, the IT infrastructure, the organizational compatibility and the benefits, they are not concerned about the content you are teaching. Do you understand it? Yes, please. So it was not yes. significant. Neither were they concerned about um, the environmental context. So the researchers are looking at environmental, but lecturers will look at environmental because at the end, the um, one of the environmental factors for lecture education partners is on the grants they get, which can support the program they are doing. So this is how a, a multi-stakeholder perspective does the work. You take each stakeholder and run the variables so you can see how they mm -hmm. do what to be the outcome like. Do you understand it? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, this one, are you with us? Yes, Prof. I'm still here. Prof, I noticed that uh, a number of papers on adoption uh, involving TOE have been done at the MESO level. I've seen that this one is multi-stakeholder, so they have included students as well. Um, if you say adoption, determinants of adoption, um, you know, if a university has a Sakai platform or any other e-learning platform, I'm, I'm only wondering whether students have a say in whether or not they want to adopt the platform or not, because this is like a top-down, uh, how will I say, strategy. So I'm kind of wondering, uh, yeah. I understand you. Uh, whether, whether the word but adoption is the right word. <laughs> it's actually true. But let me say that adoption is also used in a very broad sense. For example, the students cannot adopt it because when they go there, the platform, they don't like the platform. So they may end up rebelling on it. Do you understand me? But when the students tend to accept yes, it, accept it, then it's okay with them. Let me give an, exa an example. Do you realize that during the uh, COVID-19, a lot of lecturers realize that there are different platforms that they can use for the online lectures. There was even something they call True True, I think, I forgot the name. Not True Color, there was another one. That the Free Call, Free Call, I think the Free Conference or Free Call. So the lecturers, I remember uh, one lecturer started and even introduced me to it. The first lecture, the team was just dropping. The students were struggling to even stay online with it because they didn't want the Zoom in which after 40 minutes, every 40 minutes, you have to shut down for the free version. Well, after a free call not working, I realized that some students and lecturers even use Cisco had a platform. They use the Cisco one to teach for some time. Then also it was becoming an issue because it's not everybody could download the Cisco, go to the Cisco web page and download the software. software. And Cisco too was more concerned about people who are using their infrastructure. So that one too didn't stay well with UG. Then we went in for um, Sakai because government itself initially business school like this, we bought some licenses for lectures. And we said, and all over the world, the Sakai seems to be more stable for everybody. People are on Sakai. So we joined the bank one and went for it. Government was going to buy about a lot of licenses and give about 5,000 licenses for Sakai, of Sakai, of, of Zoom licenses to the University of Ghana. So then, then, then the next morning, we are all ready for Zoom. Then, then we fast forward and we realized that 
um, if government is not continuing, how do we sustain the relationship? And so even the government, it could only buy the licenses up to. So this is, government is coming as an environmental variable. So listen, government is coming as an environmental variable. So government could also buy and give you only up to, I think, um, the 300, I don't know, 100, the 100 participants at a time. So if you wanted anything more than that, you have to find your own subscription and try to get about 500 students. So we're looking at what, what can help. And our, our lectures, lectures were saying that they have got a very large number of students. So what, how can we be able to monitor and then be able to get a platform that is can be integrated into our educational assessment system and everything. So by the time we realized um, uh, we wanted Zoom, but they went for a meeting and the meeting at the end of the meeting, they realized that we already have a relationship with Microsoft. Microsoft, or just because we told them we're interested, we gave us 4,000 licenses of, of themes. And we already we're using Microsoft Outlook for our email. So what do you, what do you see? On top, on top of it, to sit on the university infrastructure, it became easy for us to move towards themes. The same university had actually worked, worked with government and they had supported lectures using Zoom. The next semester, we came back and they said we are using Teams. And people are not professors, so they started team teaching. Even they are doing their team classes and started certifying people on teams. By the time we realized, the university came out with a communicate that from now on, all the official platform for teaching and everything will be teams. Some people are still using Zoom because Zoom is still supported. And it was something that was done on the government infrastructure through NITA. So that one will be there for some time. So you cannot mm -hmm. actually just get, uh, get up and get lost. But what we have realized is that at the end of the day, some people to have moved onto themes and other platforms that makes things easier and faster for them. Okay. So mm -hmm. you can have all the three variables playing, but the question is, what questions is the variables asking at each level? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's rough. Okay. So this is good. No other question from here. Let me move on to another one. So now we're looking at e-commerce readiness in a developing country. Now e-commerce readiness has to talk about the how ready an, uh, an organization uh, the country is. That means that the kind of study we are trying to do it sits at the macro level. It sits at the macro level, but we are looking at the experiences of Ghanaian firms. So we are not coming back at the micro level. The firm is at the micro level. Sometimes the micro level can be individuals, depending on how you conceptualize. So this study. Let's say the micro level is the, in, is the firms and then the meso level is the industry. The macro level is the, is the nation. And the meta level is the cross-country studies and national um, uh, multinational type of studies. Okay. So the purpose is trying to, the paper is trying to, uh, objective is trying to find, find factors that affect the assimilation or the uptake of electronic commerce in Ghana and the solutions that Ghanaian firms have developed by knowing that we can be able to use it to be able to um, create best practices that others can follow. Now, drawing from the elements of two electronic commerce readiness frameworks, the study analyzes the readiness of Ghana to support the conduct of electronic commerce at the firm level. So remember, the study covers government, technology, market, and culture. All of these are what, can't you see how all of them are environmental factors? Government, technology. So technology here, may be seen as a, a factor on its own, but it's also working on the either technology in the organization or technology outside the organization in the, in the industry. Because it's, you have that technology, and then market and then cultural readiness. Now, how was this model developed? Now, to be able to develop this model, we look at e-commerce and the e-commerce itself has different dimensions. E-commerce is defined as sharing of business information, maintaining business relationships, and conducting business transactions by means of telecommunication. So this is coming from my page. To conceptualize e-commerce from Zal's definition. So now Zal's definition is being used as a conceptualization of e-commerce. And for this research, it can be argued that depending on the type of technology involved, the extent of integration into e-business processes in the value chain, e-commerce may constitute part of the business process or an entire processes. Note that part of in, in entire processes. So because there are several forms of information exchange between businesses, that B2B, between customers, C2C, between customers and businesses, B2C, and government and business, D2B. So that is what means that the e-commerce characterizes all of these things. But the nature of the market operations and the resource strength may, may differ. So firms that are, firms are likely to take a different part in trying to gain um, some Adopt e-commerce and use it for to attack and use it within their uh, within their business operations. 
Mola and Leka, Mola is my PhD supervisor. So Mola and Leka, and this is coming from Mola's PhD. Mola and Leka 2005A, in their perceived readiness model, present a hierarchical model of functional applications of the internet by the firms. So you are saying that for you to understand e-commerce very well, you have to see how they adopt the phase of e-commerce firms go through. Because at each level, it tells you the capacity the firm has. So there's the first level of no e-commerce, no e-commerce at all. The firm is just there, no e-commerce. The second level is a connected e-commerce where you have some form of connection through telephone call and not um, and not necessarily uh, an interactive, any interactive thing or continuous discussion. So to a connected, so telephone call maybe at a connected level. Then you may have a static, in fact, the definition explanations are even here. So at the connected e-commerce, the intended e-commerce capabilities communication. So your focus is on communication, email alongside traditional ICT like fax and telephone. Okay. Now you can use that one to even connect to your trading partners. See, they are all linked together. Static e-commerce builds on the connected e-commerce and extends the communication capability, information capability. So here you see the firm is more active in giving information out. So there's a website that gives information out, and that's all that they do. It's not interactive, it's all really waiting to listen to what you will see. Okay, and then interactive e-commerce creates an interactional capability, which adds the capability of online interaction, uh, interactions and queries between the firm and its customers to the informational, uh, hey, between the firm and its customers to the information capability. So what is that? It's adding an, an interactive capability to the information capability. So now you've got interactive e-commerce. So what you see is interactive capability. Now what transactive e-commerce, that is more about transactions. So you can create an account, you can be able to have information, have a cart added to it and sell. So um, somebody can say that the basic version of Amazon for ability for you to let you buy things and sell is a transactive e-commerce. Now what integrated? Now, the, the more advanced or the, the current version of Amazon is more integrated because what it does is that it is links, it is synchronized when you are buying, it's synchronized with their um with, with your warehouse and your back end. So at the, as whatever you are doing there and you are purchasing, as soon as you even add a product into your, your basket, if the product is withheld for about an hour, if you don't purchase it at an hour, it's released back into the system. So what you see here is that there's an integration. So some customers, uh, some um, um, trading partners may even be linked to it. So that as you are buying something like you are selling Tampico, as Tampico is getting to its refill level, Maybe you say that you give me two, three bags all the time. As soon as they find we are on the third bag and we are half of the third bag, a trigger will go to Tampico factory and tell them that which is what is only inside at the third level. So please, you have to restore by tomorrow morning so that you can come to optimum status of selling Tampico. Otherwise, you lose out for that hours that you don't have Tampico there. Because some products sell by hour. So when your product is finished by that hour and people keep on coming, you know, find, they'll find an alternative and they'll drop you. So you see in this scenario, integrated one becomes the optimum level where we all want to get to, where things are connected with the back office. Now, when we come to e-commerce adoption, we have to then look at what are the frameworks that helps us to understand e-commerce adoption. There are different types of frameworks, but and there are complexities of factors. So, so the perceived e-commerce -readiness, e readiness model developed by Mola and Leka was trying to look at the comprehensive model, which is those interactions something more like a TOE framework, where you can bring all the dimension of the factors together in one type of discussion. So that people can see how the factors depend on each other to be able to let e-commerce survive or not survive in a country. So that's why you bought the PEM model. Okay. Then there's another model you call the a, a framework we call the CPT framework, culture, policy, and technology. That's also an environmental framework in which Bahaj, Bajaj and Leona did. So now we have one coming from um the pair model and another one coming from um um the bajaj that cpt film the cpt dimensions of e-commerce challenges that focus on e-commerce challenges they put them together then they are able to generate what they use as their research framework so the pair model let's look at the pair model the pair model in the in this respect the pair model Okay, so let me point out. However, while two frameworks bring uh, um, into focus the external issues that organizations have to contain the e-commerce adoption, they are silent on the internal organization prerequisites. The prerequisites include technical knowledge, expertise, innovativeness, and strategic insight to adopt e-commerce. In respect, in this respect, the perceived e-readiness model, the PEM model by Mola and Leka, comes to rescue. 
the model tends to embrace the managerial internal and external contextual issue that's why i say the social interactions it has got the managerial it has got the internal it has got the external so what it's doing is bringing the different categories of uh, 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 factors together it consists of two constructs the perceived organization ready, readiness readiness uh, uh, model so there's one side perceived organization readiness and then perceived external readiness so one is look at the inside the organization factors others is look at the external factors while the toe just look at organization environmental and technology the pep model looks at organization readiness for e-commerce and the external readiness for e-commerce now Somebody is saying, that, Prof, can I do something like that for my PhD? Yes. So cryptocurrency. So you yeah, look at cryptocurrency at the organizational level. So you can look at the, you can even look at technological readiness for the organization. You can look at the organization readiness itself in terms of human skill and capacity. And you can look at the environmental release, the policy from Bank of Ghana and everything. So you have now developed the, the readiness framework. So you may call yours um, uh, 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 perceived uh, organizational uh, uh, readiness model for cryptocurrency. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And that can be a good contribution, especially for developing countries. Are we thinking? Yes, Prof. <laughs> yes, Prof. Okay. <laughs> so, so the POER consists of technological factors. That's the organization one. So he has combined technological factors. He didn't separate the technology from the, the TOE separate the technology from the organization, but this one doesn't do that. He considered the organization to be the one who owns the technology already. So you look at the technology, fa uh, technology factors, that's organization perception and comprehension of e-commerce and its potential benefits, managerial factors, managerial commitment and in strategic insight, and organizational factors, organizational resources and business processes. That makes the whole part. So the whole part of readiness means that you need to be technologically ready, managerial ready, and organizationally ready. That's the that's the OU part, the OER. Then the EER, the peer one talks about environmental imperative factors environmental imperative factors can be diverse some of them include um he's not mentioned them here but i know that they include government and they also look look, look uh, looks at i don't know whether he has it does he have it in here this is my phd so if you can find it oh my he doesn't i didn't break it down yet my own paper <laughs> So organization assessment and evaluation of the external environment. So anything in the environment, culture, government, all of them are in the environment. Policy, competition, all of them are in the environment. So unlike the earlier discussed framework, PEM model has been subject to one subject to some scrutiny through empirical studies. Sometimes when you choose a model, you have to make sure the study has gone, the models are going to through scrutiny. And they are told about some of the weaknesses of the model. So that when you're using the model, you can address the weaknesses of the model and make it stronger. That's why I mentioned that you part of why you do a PhD is to extend a theory or to be able to bring new value to a theory. So you can pick somebody's or look at the weaknesses of that one and add to it. Okay. The D study summits that the human business and technological resources and awareness are influencing factors at the initial adoption of the e-commerce. However, these factors become less important at the organization uh, to organize as they develop higher levels of e-commerce. The environmental factors, managerial and uh, managerial com commitment and strategic insight or governance model of organization become more pertinent at e-commerce industrialization. So this is very interesting. What you're trying to say that models, uh, we should also look at the factors as being uh, on a trajectory, on a continuum. When you are starting e-commerce, some things are not as important as as what a the human the business and technical resources those ones are very good when you're starting e-commerce uh, adoption and these are the things that you want to be able to consider so you have got this one um, i'm sorry so i'm talking about this one so let's look at here these factors that's what i'm talking about so the oh, vanishing pen and you are vanishing to <laughs> uh, see if i can take it take a line with okay it's good it's good hey. okay Anyway, don't worry, let me continue my work. <laughs> I think if I take it from here, it will be better from the distance. 
Okay, so let, let's look at it. So, please, are you seeing me? What I'm doing? Yes, Bob. Mm-hmm. So, these are the factors yes, here. Sir. This one. Now, he's saying that after the e commerce becomes, you, you gain adoption and you, your initial stage, you move from initial stage to much more institutionalization, you want to be part of the organization. What will help you to be part of the organization is the environment and the policies in the environment, the managerial commitment, your, your office has to still be committed to it, and the in strategic insight or governance model, how you're going to leverage it for business value becomes more pertinent. So you see how it is. So it's trying to that the factor should never be seen as a, a static set of factors. They are also in the continuum. The findings also shared by previous studies by Khan and Chow and Grandin and Pearson. The above perspective technological, managerial, organizational environment that do interrelate. I think that there's a complex interaction. The pair model is perhaps the only model that currently at that time brings a comprehensive approach to evaluating and understanding the multi-pronged challenges of e-commerce adoption and institutionalization in issue. But however, the pair model lacks very specific very attention to culture and policy variable. I didn't even know. So you see the weaknesses that somebody has given. So I need to add the CPT. I need to add the sorry, the CPT framework. CPT is culture, policy, and technology. So I took the C and the P and added to the PEM. And then I was able to get my framework. So now look at how the framework was developed. Now, the primary electronic communication network being said in the study in this study is internet and this application B2B and B2C. Listen, I was telling somebody in my PhD, a PhD right now, today or yesterday. You see, even though you are doing a study on a particular area, you have to let us know which technology you are looking at. He was doing something on mobile technology adoption. And he, he just continued talking about it. I said, which of the mobile technology, mobile devices? Because mobile means that something which is portable. And IBM says that anything that is portable is mobile. So when you talk about mobile devices, even wireless devices are mobile, like your, your, your router. It's a mobile device. I didn't even know. So I asked him that if you be able to avoid ambiguity at your PhD defense, put into brackets smartphone and tablets because that is where you focus on otherwise that broad definition of mobile devices or mobile technology can go and be against you at the viva the same way is what this gentleman is trying to tell you that this is what he's looking into because e-commerce is boss which of the e-commerce is looking to b2b and b2c okay now to, for b2b and b2c what are the elements you're looking for we adopt four elements you are combining two theories now because one theory cannot solve the problem problem to, you adopt four elements from the CPT framework and then the PEM model. For each element, we identify and discuss the critical issue that we have to, which have or continue to influence the diffusion of ICT or the internet services and economy of e-commerce. The first one, government readiness. Government readiness, as as in PEM model and as in policy, as policy in CPT. So. PEM model has something called government readiness. That's what you're taking as is. So government readiness as in the PEM model and as in core policy in the CPT framework. Um, um, hey, Zelda, please, you understand it. PEM model, the government readiness is your first variable. But the government readiness is taken from the PEM model. But the CPT framework, it is it's synonymous to the policy part. Do you understand what you're trying to say? Yes, bro. So, so it, if it, ref, it refers to the commitment of government through policy measures and related projects to facilitate the future of ICTs and utilization of e-commerce. This influences the confidence of businesses and the propensity to engage the e-commerce activity. We are examining the impact. So what did you do? To be able to solve this problem, we examined the impact of the technical reforms in policy reforms and ICT policies in Ghana. So that's why, how you answered that one. Technological readiness. Noted as a subset of supporting industries in the PEM model. So, PEM model doesn't have any factor uh, at a high level called technology ready, but they have got what they call supporting industries. Within the supporting industry, one of the variables is called technological readiness. So, PEM model, technological readiness, as noted as a subset of supporting industries in the PEM model, or as noted as technology in the CPT. Do you understand it now? Uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, what's his name? Uh, Jefferson, get up and walk around. Your voice is sound like somebody will sleep. <laughs> okay. The ability of firms to engage in the e commerce 
effectively it depends on the number of supporting industries, including availability of support services from the IT industry. Previous research has argued two critical issues, accessibility and affordability too. So you see that he has taken a variable already, but he's looking at literature to support what he's talking about. So the rest is coming from which accessibility and affordability to confirm access to ICT services. So you look at that. And then he, so we examine these two issues, that accessibility and affordability within it. Okay. Then market force readiness as in PEM model. So my PEM model has come to call market force readiness. Market force readiness refers to the application use of e-commerce by a first competitor, customers and suppliers and trading partners. It is argued that the perceived social pressure to perform or not to perform a behavior, utilize, like, such as utilizing e-commerce, is influenced by market forces, competitors, customers, and trading partners, the Santos and Perverse. Uh, Perfect or uh, whatever. We identified two issues of concern. The extent of e-commerce adoption, as a level of sophistication, and the extent of usage of e-commerce applications by the market forces impinging on the firm would influence the adoption of the e-commerce. So if uh, your competitors are doing it very well, they have, uh, they have adopted it to a high extent and they are using it, it could influence you. The last one is cultural readiness, as seen in the CPT. There's no cultural readiness in the PEM model, so we drop it. We examine the trust between the parties in transaction, the patterns of communication. So if you look at my the work itself, I have got the technological readiness, the government readiness, and the market readiness, and then cultural readiness. So if you look at my research question, which is tied to my research framework, how do these readiness factors pre, as preconditions, government readiness, the technology readiness, market and culture enable or constrain the adoption of e and usage of e-commerce? How are Ghanaian firms addressing these challenges or take advantage of the opportunity posed by the factors? So if you look at this very carefully, after collecting the data, my first section is government readiness. We briefly discussed the impact of the telecom policy reforms and government-led IC initiatives in Ghana. And I discuss and I bring some of the data there. From after that, I come up with lesson one. Usually, because I'm a critical realist, critical realist is like drawing postulations from the data they have. So the first finding I have here is that. Government readiness to address resource poverty in DC's context has an internal effect on the fusion of ICT related services. When government is more putting more into to address the, the, the resource poverty, you are going to see more ICT services being deployed. When government tightens, less ICT, e levy is an example, so I don't need to go into, the, into detail. However, we also argue that government led efforts tend to have no direct effect on the extent of usage of ICT infrastructure and benefits at the firm level. Now, government may do something, but the firm may not pick it up. That's what I'm trying to say. Or the firm, government may not do something, but the firms may, some may go around government and be able to adopt certain technology and use it to do their business across the world. Amazon is like that. Um, Facebook is like that. They bypass their government and do things in Africa. Okay. However, we also argue that, okay, I've mentioned that one. Now, about technological readiness, look at accessibility and affordability. Then, you, then you after that, you go on to. Okay, so the next one that you have here is, um, oh, sorry. I think, I made a mistake here. So we're looking at technological readiness. When you finish technological readiness, you have three, two, two lessons. First, with the requisite managerial capabilities, are able to develop innovative resource strategies, which enable to circumvent and address their resource constraints while creating business value. Then, in resource work, on the ICT diffuse along the path of least cost of adoption, which stands for a complex interaction of global, national, and firm level resources. So, as I was mentioning earlier, the combination of resources makes the firm, firm survive in developing countries. So then we have got market first readiness, the extent of e-commerce adoption and the level of adoption. So that one to discuss it. So at the end of the day, we go to cultural readiness. So we all of the, the research framework is actually guiding the study. And the research framework was developed out of two, two, two theoretical frameworks. The one from PEM model from this um uh, for um uh, uh, Mola and Leka, and then the Bajaj and, and Leonard's uh, CPT framework, that's the culture, policy, and, and, and transactions. Okay, so any questions so far? I'm not trying to read the whole question, but I'm just telling you how, what role they play. Yeah, Prof. Yes. When, well, when you were teaching about the theories, you said sometimes in the study, in the PhD, 
you can use two theories yes, uh, like like in this case uh, sometimes too you can just pick a construct from mm -hmm. one particular theory and add to another full theory yes please uh looking at this particular example mm -hmm. where cpt and mpem were used mm -hmm. i noticed that almost all the constructs can be found in pem except the cultural yes but the and explanation it. how it's in pem may be a little bit different house in cpt okay so, so it's that's important then to use the two yeah, yeah, good well policy is different from government readiness okay yes so that you can you can understand the two where they come from remember that what i told you the way we would uh, establish the frame is different from the uh, the, the theory you have the theories there but the frame that you are going to study collect for your study let me give you an example your your wedding is coming you are going to do a three tier cake you have a picture you give it to um, um zelda to do it and you then you give it to let's see mommy for to do it now they will all finish the cake but zelda will have a style mommy for will have a style you understand know what i'm trying to say even if they give them the same ingredients they they they, they so in the same kind of study, somebody may pick certain variables and but the, the, to be able to enhance the rigor of your work for the scientific community. That's why I say, look at the quality of the factor. The factor has asked this and as seen in this. I wanted to show you an example, but I wanted to finish this one. Let me just show you an example using an online platform. Let's go here online. So let's see, I want to show you something. Look at this one. Tam is the genesis of most of the theories that we use. In fact, it's not even Tam, it's a theory of reason actions there. Theory of reason action. Uh, theory. Theory of reason action. Why we react in a particular way. Now look at the theory of reason action. It's a behavioral theory. It's not a man. So attitudes, subjective norms, behavioral intention, and behavior. He said that your intention to perform a behavior is from influenced by attitude and norms in that can subject you, like peer flu influence. Do you see what's happening here? And it, then it can lead you to perform, performance of the behavior. So let's save this one down. And call it CRA. Oh, okay. Let me see. Good. Now let me go again. I'm, I'm going to keep this in mind, though. I'm going to open. Let me open it here. Good. So I see it here later. Then I'm going to do another one. So let's now look at. You know, somebody has even done chair plan behavior in this. Good. Now this is a chair plan behavior. Attitude. So somebody created a chair plan behavior and, and extended it and that some some behavior some behavior can be controlled there can be control measures so you put in agent is the one who did it again the same agent developed a, a chair of reason actually and later on he came back after some critique with others and added the perceived behavioral control that that this variable here perceived behavioral control can be the variable that can actually influence um um perceived behavioral control can influence the per actual performance of the behavior so it goes also here not just the intention for example when you are going, we, we can have a favorable attitude of going to the mall. My friends are going to the mall, so peers are influencing me. But when we get to the mall, the actual behavior there can be influenced by my income. So perceived behavior control is a situation impediment that tends to constrain the individual from performing the behavior. Self-efficacy is one. I'm not confident of the technology. So even though I've got a good attitude, the attitude is, is there, I wish I could do it. The, my friends are telling me, maybe my skill level is not that high so my self-efficacy may be low and i will not have strong intention to do it and if i do it i'll still be harboring fear so i'll be second guessing myself so all of them is coming from situation impediments that tend to it's like you collect money that you go and vote for uh, uh john Budu, and while you're in the queue you move ahead they go and vote for somebody else <laughs> so i thought you realize <laughs> <laughs> so your body believes that he's going to win, but I don't realize <laughs> because you change your mind. So you, wow, you look at your situation impediments and tell it, this is what is you have been waiting for for, for almost seven years. We are not seeing top. Let's change and go to the other side. So you change your mind while you're in the queue to vote. <laughs> so it goes to you. So the fact that the person has intention does not mean that there are other control factors. I even hear that some people they can just call them and say that I realize that you are sleeping in a, a dormitory. When you came for the uh, uh, for the for the for the co co convention or for the religious conference, uh, this is a ticket. This is a, 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 a nearby hotel. I've already booked four rooms for you and your people at uh, Golden Tulip. So the, uh, when you go there, ask for Kwamina. Then, 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 then the people will change their mind <laughs> because we are, are concerned about them. <laughs> yeah, concerned about them. So 
at the end of the day, I, I saw a picture of the Mbwedu sitting in the grass and quiet and trying to sleep. It's not easy. <laughs> when you lose, you have to sleep. Mm. <laughs> the, the, the world is not fair. <laughs> okay, so now oh, you yeah. see this yes. one. Then let, now, now, now let's take, let's go to the technological, the, the technology determinant one. So let's say time has got several variations after a lot of critique. So let's go at time one. So this is the, this is time one. This is time one. Um, okay. So perceive is for the perceive is of use, intention to use. Now do you realize what is a natural use? So this is the same theory, but this one is about how you see the thing to be useful to you the ease of use of it so and then you say that if the thing is easy, easy to use to you your perception the, your usefulness will be reinforced that's why there's an arrow from here go to perceive usefulness then it comes here the intention to use in actual usage now after some time the critique for time was that time was all looking at the social issue now friends are not here peer influence subjective name is not captured here so people a gentleman called Vegatash, as part of his PhD, and are working for, I think he did it in MIT or somewhere, but he was working with Davis and other people. You see that, the, 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 what is interesting about the, all these theories is that it's about who you're working with. Too. So the, Vegatash, this Indian guy, is actually sitting under Davis and Co. and studying. And then he says that, oh, why don't you do a, a, a review of all the technology acceptance models that exist on all the variations? And then let us come up with a better one after testing over a thousand people come out with a better one that kind of encapsulates everything together so that one then led us to what we call the utaut model which we have had as a unified theory of technology acceptance ut you thought sorry you thought theory i was a te technology acceptance and use of technology so utaut so if you got utaut he actually bought performance expectancy that's perceived usefulness that's what I wanted you guys to see. That, as in the other one, as perceived usefulness. Then effort. Oh, this is too small. Let's pick a bigger one. Uh, I would like the Wikipedia version. No worry. Hoping this one will be bigger. Oh, this is even worse. See. No, I hope you can see. I hope you can see. Yes, bro. So performance expectancy is the same as all perceived usefulness. What about effort effort expectancy? How will it relate to time? Ease of use. Ease of use, good. Social influence. How will it relate to terror plan behavior? Objective norm. Good. Facilitating conditions, how will it relate to your plan behavior? Behavioral control. Behavioral control. Good. So you see that the guy has done it and just changed the name. <laughs> but what they did, which is good, is that they told you that all this is motivated by gender. Male and female will have differences in how they respond to these things. Maybe for certain technology, male may find it more easy to use than others. Age. Certain age groups will also have different experiences. Experience or the person that the person brings can only affect, look at where the arrows or experience is going. Facilitating conditions, effort expectancy, and social influence. Experience doesn't go to performance expectancy. Do you, do you realize what is happening? Which is very interesting. The volunteer, voluntarity, which you mentioned, voluntariness, is coming from social influence. So if the, things, the person is being coerced, it could also affect the way to what, uh, uh, Whereas it may to affect the way he may respond to the to the uh, adoption of the technology. So this guy bought this one as something very in, uh, as an integrated model to be able to capture everything. But I realize that it still doesn't capture the um this is a this is what we call the level that theory acts. This acts at the individual level. So it doesn't capture the 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 societal issues or the environmental issues like competitive pressure like um, um the government policy ict climate in the country all those things are not captured there because it's not a it's not a, at the level of the meta or the level of the macro or the level of the meso it's an individual level study individual individual level 
So also always remember what level is your study on. Some people have got PhD that they are doing different levels of study at the same time. Some studies are at the organization level. Some studies are the the individual level. Some studies are the I'm not saying that it means that you talk to you won't talk to individuals even if you are not doing a study on individual. What I'm trying to say that when you finish and you are making conclusion, is it on the individual or is on the on the on the firm or on the industry or on the nation? That's what I'm talking about. The level of analysis. What level of analysis are you seeing? So you can't say you're using the time, the, the theory of plan behavior or only the theory of plan behavior the uh, um, um, UTA, UTA, all of that individual level theory, theory. You can't say you're using that one to study a whole organization and how the organization adopts technology. How the employees, good, but how the organization know? How the employee is good. So you can use to study maybe employee, employees of, 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 of car bank or employees in the banking industry. So you can compare. In that case, you may have to have another variable that is, will, fact, will capture the the, where you, the domain you belong to, whether you are in this bank or this bank, so that we can be able to do the differentiation. But whatever it is, it's still at the employee level that you are testing. Are we good? Are we good? Yes, yes, yes Prof. Yes, please. Yes, Prof. Okay. So we finish with this one. Let's pick yes, another Prof. one. Okay, so let's look at one that doesn't have a direct theory that we may think about and then try to build something. I guess... Let me jump to something that's more interesting. So uh, let me look at, look at this health barriers. Okay. This health barriers was done by uh, Jacqueline Kuma and Abikan Kuma. I think they are relatives. Okay. But Jacqueline is in um, um, Winneba, well, education. And then um, um, well, in Kuma himself, I think the sister is a sister. And Kuma is a professor. And Kuma himself is in, Abikan Kuma is in business school. Okay, so they are studying facilitators and barriers of e patient centered care at the organization level. You see, at the what organization level? Patient centered care at the organization level. So you are not very careful. You look at the patient centered care, you call it an individual level study. Do you understand me? So it's about the how the hospitals, the, the district hospitals offer patient care, not about how the patient feels about the organization, organization's care. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, bro. Good. Yes, bro. Good. So improving patient experience of care has been gained enormous attention. In spite of the support, support, support of patient care as a means of improving patient experience of care, scientific evidence to point, point to poor patient experience of care in Ghana. More than the little evidence on, on organization level factors. So please, whenever you are doing the PhD, ask yourself, which level factors are you doing? Are you doing a combination? Or you are doing at one level that facilitate or hamper patient-centered care. I think this way of teaching is helping you. I pick one paper and I will go through it and understand what the person did. Is it helping? Then just come and just talk about the choice yes. of the paper. Okay. <laughs> so I, I I really like. Okay, so there are two main organizational factors that we you know, name. Now, this is what we call like a force flow diagram, the facilitators and the barriers. I think uh, Zelda, you understand what the force flow because your boss likes using that. So facilitators and barriers. So the facilitators are the ones which are for, and the barriers are the ones which are against. So for the facilitators, you are seeing leadership commitment, leadership support, training and education for, for patient-centered care. And then the patient-centered care barriers are in the hospitals are leadership conceptualization of Patient centered care, lack of goals. You see, there are none of ownership types, degree of centralizing, financial constraint. None of this is about the individual. Law. All of them is at the organization level. No mistake about it. So, how did you develop it? Okay, so let's go to conceptual framework. Now, he's calling conceptual framework because at the end of the day, there's no one particular theory that can solve this thing. So, he needed. I'm jumping. Conceptual framework is about your conceptualization of how the thing works in the real world. Theoretical framework, theoretical frameworks is about somebody's proven conceptualization. So the theoretical framework is usually a, a schematic diagram of the theory. But to apply it to your theory PAD, you will end up moving from the theoretical level to the conceptual world. Do you understand it? I'll use yes, an example yes, to explain. Sorry, 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 Sorry,
Okay. Sorry, bro. I'm recording. I don't know. Okay, so oh, let's repeat that last. Let's 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 use uh, Doctor Watchings work to show you. Then we'll come back to this one. Even though what is your crap to show you what? Okay. Okay, you let's see. Maybe she is you doing um, a study on online relationship marketing. No, let me use one that we just we just talked about. Tell plan behavior. I want to use that one. Tell plan behavior. Okay. Um so bad here. Yeah, I think my eyes is asleep. Okay, so this is good. Good. Now this is called called using the child plan behavior to study brand love. So this is a theoretical work. Now you see the difference between a theoretical framework. The child plan behavior is a theoretical framework, but the conceptual framework has to be developed to study brand love. Now the child plan behavior is a theory that doesn't look at, there's no love in it. It's just for any plan behavior. And we don't really know that, we know that. So it has got three dimensions. It has got the, um, the attitude towards loving the brand the subjective norm, and then the control factors. Good. And he calls it the propensity to anthropomorphize and the vulnerability of the brand. Those are the two variables he looked at. Okay, so let's look at it. So he began by discussing brand lab. Brand lab is a concept on its own. Please, I'll also explain later to you how concepts can be used as conceptual models, conceptual frameworks. Okay, so this is a concept. Brand lab is the concept you are studying. It's in relationship marketing. Brand love, if it exists, leads to brand forgiveness, which is an outcome of brand love. So when you love, when you love a brand, you are likely to forgive the brand. So we test the influence of brand love on in this which we test the influence of brand love on we test the influence on the test of brand love tested on the brand forgiveness. We said proposes several theoretical understanding of the construct. Most agree that forgiveness is a complex thing. It involves affective cognitive, decisional, motivational, and behavioral aspects. Hey, this is interesting. Those of who will study brand forgiveness, forgiveness in future. Somebody study jealousy. So somebody can study forgiveness. <laughs> Say that forgiveness is a complex, affective, and cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral phenomena. Never did they do not agree about which aspects are most important. Forgiveness involves, involves one hand rational aspects, and the other hand is not rational. Okay. All this is about forgiveness. So he's saying that brand love has a positive influence on brand forgiveness. So that's it. Then it comes to brand, to brand behavior. <laughs> The theory of plan behavior is an extension of the theory of reason action, which was all developed by Agen. So you see Agen 1991, I told you about it. Then Agen came back in, I don't know why the person put, um, uh, Agen in 1990, 1980, developed the theory of reason action. Then 1991 came out the theory of plan behavior. Sorry, I was interchanging them in my statement, although the reading was the right way. So the theory of Plan behavior is an extension of the theory of reason, as which I mentioned earlier. Agent and Fitchman did in 1980, and then 10 years after, there's something about 10 years. Almost everyone's of the theories after 10 years, somebody comes up with something else. So that the person that saw somebody else. Okay, so when they finished, they came up with this variable saying that this psychological theory has a number of dimensions: that attitude towards the behavior, the subjective on the control and the control factors. So he explains them already. Now he integrates. Listen very carefully integration of the theory of plan behavior leave the abstract world and come into the real world integrate the theory of plan behavior to the brand love do you understand what i was telling you earlier so the theoretical framework we have is the theory of plan behavior but we are now moving from that level to put it into what we want to state the concept the concept what you said is brand love so you are placing it there the study is to investigate the influence of attitude subjective and control factor on brand love so we are leaving the theoretical state to the conceptual state now. According to Simon, attitude is relatively enduring predisposition to, to, feel, to respond favorably or unfavorably towards something. It is defined as the sum of expected outcomes that is weighted by an evaluation of desirability outcome of the outcome. Attitudes are restricted to the to, to, to that uh, actually attitudes are restricted to those that are salient and therefore easily brought into mind by consumers okay again and Fishman argue that thoughts do not readily come in the mind in unless unless station and elicitation in an elicitation are likely unlikely to affect the behavior in line their argumentation in line with the argumentation, the argumentation 
Batra et al. argue that the strength of an attitude is logically related to brand love. They suggest that the strength of an attitude results in more frequent thinking and talking about the brand. So if you love the brand, you may end up talking about it, but your attitude will be very positive. So that is established. Subjective norm. Subjective norm refers to, this is what we call hypothesis building, or we can call it proposition building. We can also do it in qualitative, we call it that one propositions. This one is hypothesis. I will explain that one later on when I'm displaying propositions and hypotheses. Okay. Now, subjective norm refers to desire to act as others think you should act, and therefore internally controlled. It consists of the person's belief about whether others who are important think, who are important think he or she should act in the behavior. So, subjective norm are assumed to have two components: beliefs about other people who may be in some way important to the person, who likely who like them to behave in a particular way. Applied, you know, well, so that was the second one. Believe other person, two components, who like maybe, you know, who like to be, and the positive and negative judgments about, sorry, so the first one is about what people say about you. The second one is about positive and negative judgments about each belief, okay. Apply to this study, subjective norms refer, apply to the study, do you see it? Apply to the study, leave the theoretical and come to the conceptual. Apply to the subjective norms reflect the consumer's perceptions of whether the feeling of brand love for a brand is accepted or encouraged and implemented by the consumer circle of influence. Peer reviews and recommendations are increasingly influencing consumer purchase decisions. So we are now come to the real world. So we are conceptualizing. Show that uh, Carol and uh, Ahuvia showed that self-expressive brands lead to a higher brand love due to the fact that self-expressive brands signal personal information to significant others. In the same line, Karajuloto et al. argue that consumer select brands they believe members of their reference or inspirational group choose. Brands that are able to elicit greater brand love are able to satisfy consumer social needs. So perceive brand, so perceive so, so subjective social norm has a positive joint brand love. Facilitating conditions about whether you can buy affordability is one and anthropomorphism. That means that you try you treat a brand like a human being. I don't want to go into the, the, the tendency to anthropomorphize a brand has to be positive. Like when you start, like how people say they love their car and they treat they worship their car. They will even defend their car. If you hear, if you hear you're talking about into my best, you come and defend it right now, even if he doesn't know what you are talking about. <laughs> the tendency to, to treat they, they tend to anthropomorphize a brand as a positive influence on brand love. I don't know whether you saw this advert. Um, before the elections, there was a lady who was standing there who was wearing this traditional clothes and was giving uh, uh, John, John uh, what's his name? What's the name of that guy? Uh, John Bodu appellations. So as you're giving appellations, you're, you're pouring money on her. Oh, she, like their daughter. <laughs> She did it. Ah, play. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, when they finish it, they said, she the woman should bring the money back. <laughs> the, the woman, as we were talking, she was collecting the money and she was giving her a pleasure. Oh, yeah, back home. We said, hey, it was very easy cry. <laughs> okay. Probably so, they, you see, if you, treat, if you treat the brand like a human being, that's what you end up being. Okay. Hmm. So, as, as, for much, as, for, as aforementioned, control factors incorporate besides inner and also external difficulty factors. In consumption context, affordability of a brand restrains the consumer from pursuing his needs. So affordability becomes another issue. So he talks about the fact that affordability can also affect the brand la- brand and the brand love. So that's another thing. But then he has another variable again called involvement. Addition, the more trading, moderating role of involvement with the product category is investigated in the study. Such Zakowski defines involvement as the person's perceived relevance or the object's based on inherent needs, values, and interests. In this line, consumers are personally involved with the product category to the extent that they care about the entity and perceive it as important. So the more you involve a brand, is, the more you love a brand. That's what he's trying mm-hmm. to say. Mm-hmm. Now, he used the word moderating rule. So moderating needs to be explained. And let me, that last must done as it. I end up confusing to yourself. This time I want to just use the word moderating variable okay so let's see okay so let's use examples here a mediating a mediating variable 
of a data explains the process to which two variables are related. So you have to go through meat before it can happen. That's the mediator. A moderating variable affect the strength and direction of the relationship. Okay. So, for example, for mediator, for example, sleep quality, an independent variable, can be affected by, can it affect academic achievement, a dependent variable, through the mediator of alertness. In the mediation relationship, you can draw an arrow from the independent variable to the mediator, and then from the mediator to the to the independent variable. So we draw an arrow from sleep quality, an independent variable, and then the outcome is academic achievement. So you draw an arrow, sleep quality goes to alertness, and then you get academic achievement. That means that if your sleep quality is not bad, your alertness will be low, and that academic quality is what? It will also be what? No, is that not true? Yes. yes. So that is a, that means that without without alertness, sleep quality may not have a relationship directly with academic performance. Performance. You understand me? Yes, boss. That's mediator. We go through you. Okay. So, for example, I'm the mediator between you and then your final result. <laughs> so you go through me to get your final <laughs> result. <laughs> <laughs> okay in contrast a moderator is something that acts upon the relation between the two variables it gives a direction or strength for example mental health status may moderate the relation between sleep quality and ach academic achievement the relation might be stronger for people with diagnosed mental health condition than for people with without them now between you and your academic uh, 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 your, your academic performance the moderator is your previous degree so it's likely that let me give an example please don't go and say it anywhere some lecturers believe that they don't like supervising students who don't have a background in information systems so if you give that lecture maybe a marketing student who is coming to do information system PhD, you say that i don't like it too much why because he believes that the ability for you to do well is that you should have had a background in information systems so information systems as a back um, uh, information system uh, second degree becomes a moderator to the relationship between you you as a student and your ability to do very well in the PhD. it's not a mediator it's a moderator so some certain background degrees so somebody went to do dondology music so currently my students who are submitting there's one from music there's one from um, um, pharmacy, there's one for market, about three for marketing and things. All of them are coming from diverse period, all come to do, in fact, I'm talking about their first degree, sorry, not their master's, um, but I'm at least it gives you an idea. So some of them, even their master's, some of them, the marketing and the, and the pharmacy is all their master's. But they have come to do PhD information sale and they are finished. Okay, they are submitting now. Now, what we are trying to say that we can then go and assess those who came from computer science, are they really doing better than those who came from um, the marketing and, and the finance and uh, marketing and and, and 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 pharmacy? So that's how the moderator does it. Do, do we understand it now, gentlemen? Do you understand it now? Yes, please. Yes, please. Sorry. Um, yes, so the, yes, bro. So the so the, the the moderator is this one. It will affect this relationship. It can make it, it can either affect the direction or not. But the mediator is passing through. Okay. So when we say involvement, involvement is now here. And they have got brown love and got forgiveness. So the more he is saying that the way the nature of the involvement of the person into the brand can let either this one be stronger. The forgiving likelihood forgiving will be high. Do you understand me? Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. It's not passing through this one. This one means that without, if I put the involvement, man, that means that if you love a brand, if you don't get involved, you will forgive. That's wrong. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, please. Good. Okay. So let's go back. So moderating role is involvement. Now, let's see how then do we build this is now the what we call the conceptual framework. Conceptual framework is always a proposed. So you call proposed research model. Proposed research model. 
And they use the model here because the model is a representation of theoretical, for, a simplified way of representation of theoretical constructs that have been put together to explain something. The simple, the simplified way for doing it. Models do not usually have so much theorization behind them, like how frameworks are. The frameworks are more complex, uh, relatively more complex than conceptual models. I will explain that those reasons later. So look at proposed research model or conceptual model. You can even call for now. You can even call conceptual framework. So attitude is coming from where? Where is attitude coming from? Show a plan behavior. Subjective norm is coming from where? Show a plan behavior. Good. Now this also is plan, also plan behavior. Yeah, this was a perceived behavior control, but he has he has read the literature. This is coming from the literature that the literature says affordability is an issue and propensity. Propensity to anthropomorphize and treat the brand like a human being is also a variable. So he has put them under perceived moral control. This one is coming from literature review. Because in the okay. ideal sense of what we call the child plan behavior, the person who developed it didn't tell us what you should put in here. He just said the control factors, situational impediments. So every every everything you are studying may have different situational impediments. Do you understand me? But one of them which it tends to be requiring yes, a lot. One of the things that tends to requiring a lot in many of the studies is self efficacy and then income. Income is related to your for, for, for ability. So, most of the time, if you have got a model called theory of plan, you may see income showing its head somewhere or self efficacy showing itself somewhere. Self efficacy is the same as is, 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 is the same variable that is in the subset of facilitating conditions in UTA, UAT. So, the UTA, UT model, because of facilitating conditions, one of the variables there under facilitating conditions is self efficacy. I'm just letting you know. So you have got this one, attitude, subjective norm, possible record to going to brand lab and then going to forgiveness. But involvement is what is a what a moderator. This is what we call okay. a model. So do you see that the theory is there? But we uh, proposed to study brand for love. The theory doesn't have brand love in it. It is me that I'm putting it into brand love. So now I've left the theoretical state as my theoretical model to come to my conceptual model. That is why somebody may have this is my theoretical model. So I'm using three theoretical models and I put them together to generate my conceptual model. Do you understand that? Yes, boss. Okay. Very good. Prof, the, this author, they are calling their figure one proposed research model. Is it because they didn't know the difference between theoretical model and conceptual <laughs> model? That's what, that's what <laughs> no, 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 it's the same thing. Proposed research models, that means that conceptual proposed. model means that a conceptualization, your proposed let me just um me... i was just wondering why they didn't they were not specific they just no, it's, it's specific general. it's specific it's a, a research model is also a proposed research model is like what you are proposing that you use conceptual framework simplified reality by selecting certain variables and suggesting certain relations between them fisher that's fisher's definition selecting certain variables hasn't he selected certain variables Selected some from literature, selected some from, from a theory, selected brand lab as a concept, selecting certain variables and suggesting certain relationships. He went to look at the literature and put in involvement here. And then he looked into literature and said that love can go to forgiveness. Pure plan behavior never told you that. Pure plan told you the intention and the actual performance. So if your actual performance is forgiveness, what is the intention that will lead you to forgiveness? Brand love. Do you understand what is happening here? Yes, bro. So, so it means this is a conceptual yeah. model. Good. That's what I yes. said earlier. Yeah. You didn't hear. Maybe yes, you didn't but bro, he was I'm, saying that my the question is okay. research model, proposed I'm, research model. Yes, yes. a, a conceptual model is a proposed research model, it's research framework. Yes. Conceptual yes. framework and research framework are the same. I was coming to that. They are the same. The research framework is what you are using to frame the research. Whether you develop it from here okay. or not, we don't care. So okay. it's the same thing. That's why it's called proposed research. In fact, the same is a proposed research framework, which is your conceptual model. The word conceptual means that I conceptualize it myself from the literature and the, the theories. Okay, yeah. Okay. And he put the word okay. proposed because he's trying to emphasize on the conceptualization part. Propose, I conceptualized. Oh, okay. like it doesn't mean okay. that all research okay. models are conceptualized. Somebody may have conceptualized already. You are picking it up. So for this study, I'll give you the chart plan behavior, but I'm proposing to use it this way. My, my internet is unstable. Can you hear me? Did you hear me? My internet was unstable. Yes. Yes. Yes, bro. We can hear. 
Okay. So this is your proposed. Proposed. Do you understand it? Um, it's proper. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now let's look at an example. We're looking at this yes. example earlier. Yes. Okay. Look at this one. Okay. He reviewed the literature and found out barriers, and then another literature he found a facilitator, and he called them the organizational level factor that can facilitate a barrier patient-centered care. And he drew it himself that this one will, will, will have an effect. So that's why I say force flow diagram. One of the forces is coming on the left, one of the forces is coming on the right. Do you understand me? So the stronger force will win. So he called the uh, facilitating barriers of patient mm. constructed by the authors based on what? Can you see here? Based on what? Can you see it? Constructed on a base of literature review. Literature review. Good. So yeah, let's go literature. back. Literature let's review. Go based on literature review. So let's go back. Sorry. So look at what happens. A research framework or a conceptual framework. The research framework, sorry, can be developed either through a theory. You modify it, and when you modify, you get a conceptual framework, like the proposed research model. And that such a proposed research framework model can either be an adapted theory or developed from the literature, and you call it your research framework. You understand this diagram now? Yes. Yes. That's rough. If I put this diagram at first, you need to understand it. But that's why I said, let us go back to this. Uh, this um, we are not even going to slide three crowd. <laughs> oh, yes, I've done to slide seven. So look at how it is. A research from exists in the form of a theory that was picked up. Sorry. Oh, sorry. A theory that was picked up. That theory can was then adapted or modified, or like what we saw the gentleman do. And because of that, he then moved to the conceptual state from the theoretical state. Now that he's going to conceptual state, is either he did the conceptual state by modifying the theory or by combining the modification with literature review or just using literature review. Whichever way it is, go. Sometimes, if the choices are not good in the area to use, you can go straight to the literature, review the literature, develop your conceptual frame. That's why this arrow is here. This other arrow is here. So you can either go through the theory part or you go straight, straight to the literature, or you can do both. This gentleman here went straight to the literature. Why do I say that? Let's go back to his beginning, how he built the model. The conceptual, you see what he wrote here? Conceptual framework. Do you see it? Yes, prof. Good. But he didn't write the name underneath, but he's telling you that's what he's building. So conceptual framework. This study is formed by the work of Dale Chalet in his work on, uh, Chalet in his work on pages and okay, what does it take? Establish seven factors, key factors, that contributed to, to CC, PCC, Patient centered care at the organization level. The factors include, so you pick all the factors, seven of them. So this is coming from Charlie, seven of them. Or oh, more than seven. I think it's seven, or oh. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think he added one more. Or, or one of them is a longer name. But yes, seven the of them. The second one is. Uh, yeah, the second one is. Yeah. Sorry, good. So it's seven of them. So you see that this is coming from Charlie, seven. Now look at it again. He goes and say, goes on to say, okay. So after doing the chalet one, then he goes on to let me point out. So he defended why he's using a chalet. Okay. Then after that, he went on. Good. Now look at the weaknesses. It's not everybody that does everything. Even though chalet's work did not consider barriers to the PCC literature. What did he say? Literature. 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 Do you see? So somebody's model can do something, but it may not do all. The literature can help you. The same is what we saw the theory of plan behavior. He took involvement from the literature. Literature has detailed resource constraints. The same can we can see the TOE framework in the first one. He took a um, nature of the course from the literature. So don't ever think that theory, your theory is good enough. Literature has detailed resource constraints. Results to change, no employee, all these others, five or six of them. Then after he defended them. So now he said that figure one explains how facilitating the inhibiting factors at the regional level, organizational level, 
affect the PCC. From figure one, organization level barriers and facilitation of PCC exist side by side. The arrow that links, now you have to explain the model, the conceptual framework there. The arrow that links the facilitator to PCC moves in the clockwise direction, indicating the catalytic ability of facilitators to propel PCC in the right direction. What's he trying to say? Because this one has got to leadership and this and the higher organizational value, these are the people who make decisions concerning this one. So they can push the arrow. Oh. First flow diagram, lady. Is that I really see what was happening. The, the yes, facilitator okay. can push the barriers back so that, so that the adoption can take place. The mm -hmm. patient centered care can take place. Please, this is a, you can also use some, something like this for your PhD, but yes, I have to use wisdom and be it well. <laughs> Don't just say that you are drawing it. Okay, profs. So, um, with our PhD, if we are using constructive variables without an underlying theory, is it hey, allowed? Hey, 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 it's not allowed. I beg you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Always find a theorization to buy because that's what you can contribute to knowledge. Or do what the guy we saw in that you pick from different choices to develop your own. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Technically, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything you do, you can pick something from one theory. It may not be highest theory. You may go and pick from some place and pick from another place and pick from another place. The arrow, the arrow that links, okay. On the other hand, the arrow that links the barriers to PCC is anti clockwise direction, emphasizing that a beating factors have the power. That's why I say phosphor diagram have the power of, to hamper the PCC efforts from becoming successful. How can organizations can improve PCC by strengthening the facilitators and reducing the inhibitors? This is a very interesting model. I like the way it has been done. And you can do this one as an outcome of your fact. In case you do a PAD and you finish and you are seeing that. The fact that some of them are for some of the gifts, you can do it like this to show and explain what could be. The more you read and test, you see how to be able to schematically present your your your, your frameworks. Are we good? Yes, yes, boss. Yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much. So let's round up because we have done a lot today. So after examples, so the literature review, if you're writing a paper, the literature review has can be a place where the conceptual framework could be developed. The theory will represent the conceptual framework. I just have it as a separate part of its own. So you see, this is very bold. Abeka is very bold. After literature review, then he has a whole section called conceptual framework. So sometimes some people can separate it and have it stand on its own. I just make it in part of the literature review. So whichever means is okay. So in this case, it, it forms part of the literature review and the outcome of the literature review is the framework okay now some of them don't do that i think we saw different ones but in your structure of a long essay for a, a master's dissertation that you will supervise in future the literature review is where the research framework is explained but they, they don't do very for mba they don't do very complex frameworks very simple one so that they can just review factors and they use the factors to go and do the work that's all but for a PAD, we need a whole chapter called theoretical foundations and research framework. Some people even separate the research framework for the theoretical foundations. Theoretical foundation will look at all the theory that have been used to study the phenomenon of study. And after doing that, then you can then pick variables from that um, from your literature review to generate your research framework. Note that I didn't write conceptual framework. I just didn't want the ambiguity there, but you can use any of them. Are you okay? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Okay. So you go through here, or you go to the, all of them is important. So the theory is a coherent set of general propositions used for principle of explaining, understanding, and predicting apparent relations of observed phenomena. The apparent relationship means that the theory has been tested already and verified. I hope you understand me. So the theory itself is on its own, or your opinion, it has been established already. Conceptual framework is rather a suggestion, has been empirically tested and verified. Theory can come in a schematic diagram or mathematical equation. So this is a theory of plant behavior as a diagram, schematic diagram, theoretical states, abstract now. Or can come as a mathematical equation, pure prison. In fact, the theory reason action, the one I showed you earlier, it has a mathematics behind it. To reverse control is a subject, is a, a function of attitude plus subjective norm. That's all. And there are independent with empirically divided ways, which are constants by them but when you come to the conceptual state you can have different different ones you can have factor-based models 
which have got no theory and others which have got theory. Okay, the conceptual framework objective here is to simplify the reality and make it easy for us to understand. So that's what it's doing. The same way that it does it, the model also tries to simplify the reality and make it easier for us to understand. Okay, but you talk about the, the level of theorization, the framework and the model is different. So we can discuss it later. So look at like this one. This is a factor-based model. The factors are just put together, pointed to unemployment. This is coming from the literature review. So we saw that we can come from the literature review. Like we saw Abekan Chromas where it came from the literature review. Okay. Okay. Building blocks of a theory. A theory, what is its way it is organized and coherent, it has to have some parts that come together to make it a theory. Now, the theory itself is used for good. Because if the theory exists, it can inform your conceptual framework or research framework. It can help you to identify the right, right questions to ask. For example, in my master's thesis, I use the theory of um, organizational learning cycle of, of, of Dixon's organizational learning cycle. And, and this is an organizational learning cycle has about four steps in it. The first step became my research questions in my master's long essay. So you can actually let your theory guide the, the construction of your objectives or your questions. It's not wrong, it's possible. So it can also guide the selection of the relevant data because you know the constructs you are looking for. It will guide you in terms of what question questions you really ask. And how I go to look at the relationship and explore the possible causes. If 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 you realize um, this guy's work already has the question that you have to ask. The model is here. So he has asked questions on resource constraint, employee low employee value, resistance to change. He has asked questions on all this, all this. We have to come up with that one. I don't think his research questionnaire is at the back, his questionnaire is at the back. But if it was at the back, you would have seen that his questionnaire would have been used and uh, explained, explained all these things that we are talking about. There's no here. Okay. Now, the building blocks of a choice choice of all gold constructs. The constructs are the variables that we end up studying. The variables is just a measurable way of looking at the construct. So the constructs are abstract, like attitude. Then you can then express it in a way that can be measured. So look at this one. This is the theory of plan behavior. Very interesting study. But look at the back there. This is how they measured it. So Brown Lab has 22 items alone. One of the variables under Brown Lab is called uniqueness. Then he asks these two questions, pleasure, intimacy, duration, memories. Then after that, that is the end of brand love. Then it goes to chair plan behavior items, 16 items. Attitude has five items, one, two, three, four, five, six, six items. Then subjective note has one, two, three, four. Compensity to anthropomorphize, the perceived behavioral control, one, two. So these are all constructs, but we are, we are trying to uh, uh, um, um, look at how to measure them. Affordability, which is also under perceived behavioral control, has four items. Forgiveness, which is the outcome variable or the independent variable that we are going to arrive at, it has four items. Involvement, which is the moderating variable, has um, 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 five items. So this is what I was telling you that you have to know how to measure them. So those two things, you see the construct and their types of measurement. So the construct can be at a high level, then you can express it in a way that can be measured. So let me give an example. Um, you see age itself is a construct. But when you're measuring age, you can measure it as an interval, interval, like looking at um, uh, um, like 18 to 25, uh, 26 to 30. Those are interval variables. Okay. Then you can also look at it in terms of the hierarchy. And that would be what, um, what's his name? Obed or this gentleman? Um, this one, will that be ordinal? Ordinal is the one that has hierarchy within them. Yeah, that's ordinal. Good. So hierarchy means that somebody who is 25 years is older than somebody who is 24. Is that not true? Higher and lower. Yes. Okay. So you can then look at it in terms of that. But it's a continuous one. It just continues, right? It's just going to continuously go around. Now, all of them have the way you measure them, the way you're going to use them in your work. So sometimes, you know, um, right now, in, in the kind of studies I do, they tell us that we should collect the data actually ourselves, that we will code it again to fit the interval. 
because when you tell somebody that um uh, your age is, is your age are you do you fall between 18 to 25 the person is already 25 and in that year it's going to become 26 he doesn't know where you should write you write going to the 26 column or it should be in the 25 column this is what's happening so they tell you yes. the, in recent say in recent projects have been working on the thing that prove don't collect it like that you collect the actual age then you can record it into the age groups that you want so they can get the actual age of the person Okay, we but the, problem, with that but the problems with that yeah. is that in some of the communities, people can just remember uh, I was born around. So around, as soon as you say around, that means I got to choose an interval variable. Mm. Mm. Around because you can't remember the dates. Uh, time I come from Mumbai, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> an interval becomes better for you. Um, or they, they use landmarks or important events in the society to remember the time you were born. Because that's what they were told. <laughs> yeah, uh, please, uh, this one, you had a you had a feedback. Yes, yes, Prof. I, I was saying that sometimes, to when you are interested in the specific age of the person, so that ideally that's the best case. So that even when you are recording, you have several options okay. in case maybe age generation you want to the order has changed. You, okay. with you having the original data is always best but the problem with that is that sometimes people don't want to give you the actual ages it's true. even when you are interviewing them unless maybe in a study where they know they are going to have some direct benefits from you or something so yes, then they will, they will, they will, that's why sometimes many uh, researchers I've seen a study that asks both it will ask you then they also ask you the category especially in the that would be better yeah and, but they won't ask you consecutively they will ask it at the, the, the actual age in the beginning, then the ending that will ask you the category, the category one, so that you don't end up repeating yourself. Okay. So that in that case, they use one as a check on the other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, the, 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 the big some of the multinational who will pay more because every question you add also extend the questionnaire. So the more questions, the more you have to charge them. Yeah, okay. So yeah. propositions are associations that are postulated between the constructs. I mentioned that one. Some of you call it hypothesis. So qualitative, you call them propositions. So they see that you can say that this one can, can will influence this, or this one will have a relationship on this. So these ones are the proposition, the relationship between the variables. The logic is why the, the, the theoretical constructs exist. Why are they existing? For example, the theory of plan behavior exists to explain uh, the, the variables that influence a particular performance of a behavior from the intention to the actual performance. So what is the logic behind the theory? It's telling you why does it exist? For example, um, how base times height is the area of a rectangle, a, a triangle, whereas L times B is the area of a rectangle. So they all exist to explain the area of an artifact. Assumptions are what you take in mind to think that so that the theory can be able to be, uh, become applicable to what you are doing. So the theory itself is not always, uh, 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 it's in the abstract world, it's not in the physical world. So for example, if I take the length times breadth, as soon as I use length times breadth, I'm taking the mindset that the length is a smooth line that is from one point to the other, while the breadth is a smooth line from one point to the other. But in reality, if you're even taking the surface of a table, there are edges, will, some of the edges will chip and tear. So the area that you know theoretically may not be the area that you may have, even in a piece of land. Oh, I'm buying 70 by 100 land. If you go to the 70 by 100 land, some part, sometimes your 70 would have been come 68. And your hundred could have even become one ten because of some landmark there or a river or a tree or something like that. So it can affect all this. It can affect the theoretical sense. So theoretically, we know L times B, but we are assuming that the thing is a straight line. So the assumptions we make in terms of values, space, and time on all the variable um, theories that we have. For example, the boiling point of water is hundred degrees Celsius, but some water is hot. No matter what you do, that hundred degrees Celsius tumble. <laughs> So you, you may you may realize that you may realize that that 100 degrees Celsius is a theoretical that pure water the water which is pure not the water pure water means the one you drink the water that is pure 100 two parts of hydrogen and one part of organic oxygen will give you a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius pepe, pepe. if the elements within the bowl that it was heated doesn't melt and influence it it will give you then the boundary conditions where can we apply the theory and where is it not applicable. Some theories are for individual level. Some theories are good for certain type of content. They are market-based theories. They're not for studying your, your home. It's for studying markets. 
Some theories are used for studying economic systems. Some theories are used for studying uh, social behavior. Some theories are used for studying grief. How can you take a grief theory to understand motivation? Hmm? All of these things have to be looked into. Sorry. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, construct an abstract concept that is in the phenomenon of interest. They bring out the generalizable properties of related objects, people, or events of the study. Some of the constructs can be a single concept, whilst others can be multiple. So, for example, we saw in the earlier, forgiveness is a multi-dimensional construct. Remember, you mentioned different different aspects of forgiveness, affective part of forgiveness, emotional part. And uh, 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 we said um, it, it talks about affective and let me just bring the right one. I don't want to use it for my head. So let's go back. Coin defined forgiveness. It gave you the dimensions of forgiveness, as is the literature. Look at what he said. There are, nevertheless, there is the affective, cognitive, and behavioral. So all of that, even these are decisional, motivational, cognitive, and behavioral. So different outlets are different dimensions. That's what we call a multi, a multi-dimensional variable. Trust is like that. Trust has got competence, um, 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 integrity, and then what? Benevolence. This competence is the same as ability. So if you are measuring trust, if you're not very sure, you may measure only one of the only one of the constructs. You may measure competence. But I trust you can do it. You are talking about competence. I trust you bring the money back. That's integrity. Mm. I trust him. So I can give this to him. That's benevolence in terms of how you see in terms of that emotional mm -hmm. part. Despite mm -hmm. this decision, consciousness may have, must have spelled, clearly spelled out operational definition so that we can be able to use it and, and how the construct will be measured and at what level of analysis it will be applied, individual, group, organization, industry, regional, and global. So we mentioned that right now. The construct operates at the theoretical level, while the variable is used at the empirical level. That's what I was trying to say. For example, job performance as an abstract concept can be expressed in the variable as in the form of work samples, absenteeism, and production count. So some some people are there, like I was in Casa Preco. There is a line for um, uh, there's a, a a conveyor belt on the production line that helps you to cite booking bottles as the bottles are going on. So one of the person's work is to to move the booking bottles from so that they don't get packaged and they don't, they don't, they don't get filled with um, 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 maybe um, one of their products and then it will be bottled. So they, they look, mm. you have to, the scientists are standing there, they are looking at it. So the mouth of the, they look at the tip of the bottle, it's not cracked. Because the mobile, the bottles are in the conveyor belt, but they go for washing and everything. And during the washing, the sometimes some of them may hit each other and they may have cracks on it. So you have to make sure, have, have you opened Coke before you see that there's a, the bottle is somehow chipped? Mm -hmm. I don't know whether yes. I've seen that thing before, the mouth of the bottle. After you open the can, the, mm -hmm. the bottle cap, you see that it has chipped a little bit. It's mm -hmm. because of the, the, the site that didn't sit and remove it from it. Mm -hmm. Well, you mm -hmm. can cut a person, somebody is very, very sharp cut. And it also mm -hmm. connotes the fact that it has been tempered with, but sometimes it has not been tempered with. It's just a failed quality control. Good, good. So that's why I'm saying that now you see that, that can be part of job performance. So that that kind of measurement can be part. So if there are more filled bottles in it, it shows that that person's job, his his production, whatever it is, he's not been doing it very well. But you are is you in your abstract world, you call it job performance, but in the real world in collecting data, you have to express it as a variable. But sometimes a variable can and and this and this construct can be the same name, like age. Mm. Okay. Now, cultural, cultural assumptions. Sometimes theories are built to specific cultures. For example, individualistic cultures are the ones like America, and then um, uh, and the developed countries like UK, where people are very individualistic in their nature. Collective cultures are in developing countries and other collective societies like India, Africa, and, and the West African countries. Very collective in their nature. So we take decisions in the collective nature. So whenever you are doing, when you are doing a theory, and the theory is embedded in certain cultural assumptions. You know that some social social issues can influence the, the type of thing you are trying to study. Temporal uh, uh, assumptions: the thing is on a, on, on on a cycle. So there are early stages and then the, the later stages. Remember that um, temporal assumptions is what the gentleman argued in the uh, pair model that at the initial stage the variables that matter are this. 
but at the initialization stage, after you have adopted e-commerce for some time, the next variables that matter are this, that temporal assumptions. So it's trying to say that the, the fact that, that influence e-commerce readiness is not static. They are on a continuum. At a certain time is this, another time is that. The same thing with the diffusion of innovation. If you look at the diffusion of innovation model, it talks about the, let's, let's look at it from here. I don't want to use my head. That I like going to. All the, I don't remember all the, all the variables. It's called the DOI framework, DOI. Oh, what a DOI also means. <laughs> oh, yeah. DOI framework. DOI also means that that link, DOI framework. That's from Rogers. Okay. Um, I don't want its variables. Okay. So the DOI framework has variables in it. So the conceptual framework. Like this one has this one in it. I, I don't know what I can see very well. Knowledge, persuasion, decision, implementation, and confirmation. These are the things that people go to and make a decision. Social way that diffusion, diffusion is communicated in society. Let me use this one. Maybe this one will be good. This one is good. So look at this one. Can you see it now? Yes, please. So look at this. Yes, what is it? The knowledge level. When the person is exposed about the thing. Then the persuasion level. You look at the characteristics of the innovation and decision level, should I adopt or should I reject? The implementation, you end up going to actually put in, make, get the money right there to go and buy it and confirmation, then you now has it. So there are different levels of it. Now, this is the communication channel that the thing will go to, the person will go to in making a decision, the pre-decision, decision, and post-decision. Despite this one, the person says that there are different types of people who and what they go through in terms of the rate of adoption. So they are the early innovators, the early adopters, and the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. Laggards come in very late. So in applying this thing to the other one, you saw the process that you see, some people are very, go to the process faster than others. Do you understand me? So if you look at even mobile phone adoption, and mobile phone, okay, if you look at it, when they release a the new iPhone, those of them who go and stand by there, this uh, the, the, the train, the, the, the iPhone shop, and they stand there till daybreak. Those are the ones which are innovated. They want to get, in fact, the innovators couple that they have been studying the thing for the last seven months. They know the, the attributes of the technology, everything. It's like they, they have even seen it visually in their head before the thing came. <laughs> then the early adopters, those are the first people who want to think and they'll go and buy. Then mm. the majority, they wait. When a lot of people, after the early adopters are going to buy and then they are doing some promotion, everybody jumps into it and then they buy plane. Then there's an, after getting to a critical mass of people have bought it, there is also a, a, a last mile people who come. Plenty people who come because now the people here are now recommending that thing. So they all jump into it. Those who are the early majority are now recommending. So they are going to come and join. Then the laggers, when the new version comes, they are now coming. They have subsidized their old one. Unfortunately for them, Apple sometimes the subsidy is just only hundred dollars difference. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I've seen that. It's very very painful. Though. They bring the new one, and it's just hundred dollars difference between the old one and new one. So you should you have waited for nothing because, but that's what happens. Then they end up going to buy it. The laggards come in late. Now some institutions, because of the way the institution is, they are always laggards. For example, when I was working in UNESCO, we we're using um, Office. Um, um, Windows Windows 7. When people, Windows 10 had come, and when Windows 10 had come, and we were using Windows 10 as privately on our own computers, but the, comp the corporate machine that we we're using to be able to send emails, to be able to log on to our platform in, in Paris, our platform was in Paris, to integrate your Paris, it was a Windows 7 condition. And we were saying that Microsoft had now released Windows 10. They are not going to quickly go to the market and buy, because most of their systems are legacy systems, which are Windows, Windows 7, compliant so if you tell them they should change they have to change printers they have to change so many things they are not going right now so when we are moved to windows 11 that is when you see and they now have gone through a process of um uh, out of policy organization they now move so they have to test everything all their system ready for windows 10 before they move to windows 10. i don't know whether uh, um um uh jeff you have come across this kind of discussions before where organizations move gradually so you have developed your your operating environment you developed the software for them was maybe uh something for uh windows 10 or windows 11 yeah. but you got yeah. there you are using windows 95 or windows 7 
and not because they don't have money to buy, but because of the fact that they have a number of systems that are dependent. Legacy on applications, yes, yes. Sometimes yes. it's like those those old Reference. printers that don't match this printer. That printer, they use to print. <laughs> you go to slate and you want your statement. They use to print. So it's like a brush. Mm -hmm. They put, they feed it inside. They hold the paper. Hey, that's somebody's job holding the paper. <laughs> it's mainly because of the legacy applications, I think. The most so, of the legacy applications they lock on two doors and they, they open the interface, the blue interface. You can they put your name inside, they talk, exactly. and then they come, it will come printed like that. You know, invest your gonna still do something like that in some of them. Wow, <laughs> let me end it here. <laughs> but now, yeah, from at that time, to the licensing, the licensing cost and, <laughs> and the cost of training their workers' resource. Somebody, so, somebody may lose his job because of that. Yeah, right. yes. Most people lose their job because of new applications anyway okay so we come to see that it's the laggards may happen not intentional intentional but because of some of the things that you guys have mentioned but interesting somebody can actually study a phenomenon in ghana like um, let's say um, um, um uh, uh jeff you can use this this model to try to understand how people behave on your platform mm -hmm. so they can categorize the different consumers and how they consume the information so when the music comes you can actually design models for you to be able to know whether for this particular musician you are a laggard or you are a late majority or you are an early majority or an innovator for that particular musician. So a musician can be able to know how many innovators do you have. So that when he's going to launch an album, he knows how much he can sell on day one. Do you get a model? Yes. Yes, bro. <laughs> but I think you should start thinking about putting an analytics and putting a layer of this inside. So that you can draw a graph for the musician to know on his page that, okay, for this music, I have how many innovators, how many early, early adopters. So you can count it the time since the song was released on the platform when the person joined mm -hmm. to listen to you mm -hmm. to measure. So those who are in the first one week may be innovators. Those who join start listening to the first time in the second or third week, early adopters. Do you, get, do you get what I'm trying to say? You can do a, an algorithm like that, then you can use it to plot. So if you are then sending mails, you can then choose that, like, okay, I can do something to release just for the laggards, just to keep their interest in there. Anyway, I hope the vision I'm saying, the guy can do, you see his mind can, but you can't see the term, tell me. <laughs> yeah, I'm writing. <laughs> you are writing. <laughs> yes. I see how you can look at the model. Okay. So that's what we are trying to say about the. In fact, the way I'm teaching this, I've never taught it this way before. I, I hope Uber was here to oh, listen. I was going to give you a whole speech after after the <clears> class. <throat> so this is take a special assumption. This is about status and then dynamism. So there are some theories that are more static and others which are more dynamic. For example, the theory plan, the uh, resource based theory, which I use for my PhD. The resource based theory is a static theory that tries to explain how firms use resources to gain competitive advantage. So if we take the theory like this, um, which I used to write this paper. So let's look at the theory. The theory says that there are variables that govern resources. And those variables make the resource either, either uh, 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 more, more of more value to the organization or not. OK, so there are. I think I, I, if I use this one to not see it very well, I think I need a diagram. Oh, maybe, let me see, let me see, resource based here. Okay, resource based here, resource based here, resource based here. Theories and strategy. Okay, 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 good. So the, the resources are rare, valuable, non emitable and not substitute by any other one and not okay kind of assets or equivalent substitute so rare valuable it starts from valuable rare non substitute imitable you cannot perfectly copy it and you cannot perfectly uh, uh, um, um, substitute it now the first two the rare and valuable helps you to gain an advantage but when your resources are more uh, imperfectly copyable, copyable or imitable or imperfectly uh, substitutable then the theory then the the, the the resource can give you competitive advantage that's what the theory says now this one is good for a static environment but when it comes to a volatile um, environment where business like uh, uh, for, for information technology where it's very very dynamic we are releasing every 18 months new technology is coming out it's very difficult to talk about 
immutability and then uh, and substitutability because they are, they are in the same China, they are developing substitutes to remove, to compete with you, and they are even copying and parroting your own. So the what they talked about is that after some time, Bunny, who came up with this one? Bunny came up with this one. Somebody called Tease came up with another one called the dynamic capabilities model. The dynamic capabilities model was saying that firms should have some dynamism to be able to change the resource faster so that the resource itself can be able to be evolve and they may sustain its value to the company. So they end up come with the dynamic, dynamic capabilities framework, which I'll show you. I have another, I had another set of slides, which is just for showing you, explaining the theories to you. So I think we'll go to, I don't have it all here. So when, when we get to those ones, I'll, I'll, I'll use that one for you. Okay. So let's, let, let, let's continue. I, I want to round up on what I was doing. I'll stop here. I wanted to stop at this one. Okay, good. So what I wanted to emphasize here is that the theories themselves, they have um, special uh, assumptions and state assumptions. Some of them are static, some of them are, 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 and some of them are also process driven. Some of them are process. And some of them are in, a, 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 in just one state. They don't have a process in it. Okay. Now, in terms of schematic representation of a theory or a conceptual model, we can use several of them. Several of them. Some of them are the cause and effect representation, process in the hierarchy, maps and coordinates, gap, and no schematic diagram. Cause and effect is what we call the factor-based model, a group of factors coming out to an, an outcome. So these are the independent. All you see here are independent variables. This one, they're all independent variables. Political instability, low wages, lack of startup capital, interest rates, they're all independent variables. They're all going to what we call unemployment. Unemployment is in the, your a dependent variable so it depends on all of these ones and it's coming from the literature review so it's called factor based model factors pointing to an outcome factor based model some of the model some of the theories or the conceptual framework can be in stages means that they are they are either linear in the cyclical mode when they are cyclical mode you can have something like this sorry um like this is that this is coming from um organization learning cycle coming from Dixon. this is what i use for my masters Organizational learning cycle talks about private meaning, accessible meaning, and then collective meaning. If you want to learn an organization, you have to make meanings more accessible. So you have to create an environment that people can challenge private meanings, what people own, hold in their mind as individuals, and create the environment for them to share it easily. And then also allow people to challenge the collective during co corporate meetings or, or company meetings. People can challenge what the company is, where the company is going. So the more you allow people to be able to share what they know, and allow people to change what is also held as a collective then you can learn, learn together as an organization to be able to do that there are four steps generate integrate interpret and act so my master's long essay had what factors help you what how do you generate how do you integrate how do you interpret and what do you, how do you act those are the questions i was asking okay then you can have the linear one so this one is a research framework or my conversation framework for the impact of mobile phones the impact of mobile phones from the literature is incremental transformation and production. But it didn't tell you how you arrive at the impact. So I was the one who put it in, a, in the context of a micro, micro, micro trader or a market woman. She will adopt her phone. And in economics, economics says that there is four, four, three stages of trading, pre-trade, during trade and post-trade. And then e-commerce says that there's strategic benefits, initial benefits and operational benefits. So I was saying that when you put this trading when you put uh, the mobile phone to the training activity, you lead to these benefits. And these benefits are sustained and used well. It will then go to the, this impact. So I put them together. This one coming from benefits, coming from information systems and ICT and commerce literature in terms of I commercial benefits of ICT, impact of mobile phone study research, economic studies on trading. And I put them together. This is what you are talking about, a combination of theories and so the underlying theory is called the transaction cost theory. A combination of theories and literature review generated this one. So um, this one, it's possible to combine theories and literature review to generate your own framework. Now, frameworks like to bring several categories together to show complex relationships. This is why this is not called a model. Now you understand the difference between the model and the framework. Look at how a framework is complex relationships coming together. So there are several categories coming together. Factors that are put together, just loosely put together, are usually called models to just simplify the reality. But frameworks has much more going on. Do you see what I'm trying to see? Yes. 
Yes, proof. So that's the simple definition I'll give you now. I'll give you more definitions later. Just for you to see the differences. So this is hierarchy, um, um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I don't want to think you know about it, the psychological, physiological safety, belonging, self-esteem, and also of challenges. So now that now that uh, Madame has married, she's now a belonging, but because she's not being a PhD, she has moved to self-esteem, achieving mastery. So which will happen? She went here and then she came down. Interesting. That means that she went here, got a job, got security, jumped belonging and love. Or if she was already in belonging and love, okay, let's say she finished school, jumped straight to belonging and love, then went to look for a job and climb up here. Then because she had belonging and love already, then she ran out, ran to self-esteem to start the PhD. Then she came back to belonging and love. The time one, then one morning we see that she has come to self-actualization. She <laughs> is now finished the PhD. <laughs> Now, at different stages of your life, if you take the test, you realize that uh, you can find yourself, right now if you take the test, you are just um, less than a year in marriage, so you'll be here. You'll be feeling cool, all cozy. But because of the way I worry you in PhD, PhD, if you don't take, if you don't take it, when you take the test, your, your results will be confused. It's like between here and here. Mm -hmm. It's worrying you for self-esteem. My supervisor told me that when he gave birth to his first child and took the test, he, was at, he came down from his PhD and everything, he came down to security. Because of the way he was feeling. Oh. Mm -hmm. So someone like uh, 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 what's his name? Jeff. Is, Jeff, yeah. Jeff is a security right now, challenge. <laughs> security. Yeah. I was just about to say this. <laughs> I have to go and find the, the questionnaire. There's a questionnaire for it. Then you, you all can take it online and see where you find yourself. Please, please, you will want to. <laughs> then after, after a year, a, a year after after you have finished year one of the period, you take the test again, see where you <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Maps and coordinates. Maps and coordinates has to do with the ones that you can just show relationship by diagram. So you can do mapping. So this one like this is elasticity model in uh, um economics, demand and supply curve. I mean, I'm not an economic person, so I can't explain it very much, but at least you have an idea of demand going high and supply going low. Then we have got um, gap analysis. Gap analysis tells you discrepancies. We use that one in information system. There's one something called the uh, impossible model or design relative gap, which my supervisor, one of my supervisors, the Richard Higgs, that tries to tell you the dimensions of uh, measuring gap in any information system project. But the marketing also have what they call the service quality model that helps you to assess the customer's perceptions of service quality and the actual quality that you get. So you can actually see that it can they use that one to study the discrepancy between what you are looking for in a service offering and what you actually get. So you can look at tangibility of the service, reliability of the service, responsiveness, assurance, and empathy. So somebody who gives a service offering, like uh, Jeff or like you, uh, uh, like all of you here who teach, what you can then do is that you can use it as a, to measure yourself in terms of the service you are giving to your students and what you are getting back. Okay, let's end here. We're going to talk about generation of theories later. Okay, but it's been an interesting uh, two hours of trying to understand how to do this. Okay, next uh, next time I'll try and close by uh, by eight thirty. So about that. Anyway, now I made your class like an EMBA class. <laughs> anyway, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank so you. If, thank you so much, Bob. So today it's, it's on another level. <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, this that, really I'll, teach, I'll teach the same thing in the I'll teach similar things like this in the other class and in your advanced quality. You see that I will not go this far. Yeah. Because yeah, of the interactions so and the everything. Yeah. And then excuse me to say sometimes you are torn between trying to give examples from different disciplines and some disciplines will tell mm -hmm. you are forgetting about them, then it becomes a distractive, a distraction than rather helpful. But anyway, I'm happy that we have been.